Good evening. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome you all here to celebrate the appointment of Guy Oriel Charles as the Charles J. Ogletree Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Let's give Guy a big... I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Charles's wife, Laura. Thank you for being here. Um, before I talk about Professor Charles, I want to say a few words about his professorship. So this chair was established to honor the extraordinary life, career, and example of Charles J. Ogletree, Jr., the Jesse Clemenko Professor of Law Emeritus at HLS. Charles Ogletree graduated with distinction from Stanford University with bachelor's and master's degrees in political science. He then enrolled here at HLS, where he was an editor of the Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Law Review, and served on the board of the Harvard, Harvard Prison Legal Assistance Project. He graduated in 1978, and he returned to Harvard Law School first as a lecturer, and then in 1993 as professor of law. Professor Ogletree's remarkable impact stretches from his service as an attorney advancing civil rights and social justice to his years as a teacher showing his law students, including, by the way, a former US president and first lady, that the law can be an instrument for change. Here at HLS, Professor Ogletree founded the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, which carries on the unfinished work of Charles Hamilton Houston, one of the 20th century's most important scholars and civil rights litigators, under Professor Ogletree's leadership, the Institute became a central force for scholarship, advocacy, coalition building, education, and community engagement on matters concerning civil rights and equal opportunity. He also founded our Criminal Justice Institute, which very impactfully trained students to represent criminal defendants in the Boston area. And he was the creator of the, very, of the legendary Saturday School program which brought great lawyers and leaders to campus to connect with students and discuss justice, race, and equality. In 2017, during a symposium in Professor Ogletree's honor, the law school received an extraordinary gift from his friends and classmates who came to establish a chair in his honor. I want to recognize the generous donors behind this effort, Ken Chenault from the class of 1976, the chair and managing director of General Catalyst and the former chair and CEO of American Express, Ken Frazier, class of 1978, the executive chair of the board of directors of Merck, where he was president and CEO from 2011 to 2021, and Adebayo Ogunlezi, class of 1979, who's the founding partner and chair and CEO of Global Infrastructure Partners. All three are dear friends of the law school, and I'm grateful for their generosity in endowing this important chair. I also want to extend my gratitude to Ted Wells, class of 1976, for his gener generous support of Professor Ogletree's work and legacy at HLS, and to my colleague David Wil Wilkins, whose inspiration and good work led to the creation of the Ogletree chair. So let's please take a moment and give a round of applause for Professor for Ogletree and all those who made this chair a reality. Now I want to say a few words of introduction about our fabulous colleague, uh, Professor Guy Oriel Charles. So Professor Charles is a creative, path-breaking, and impactful scholar whose writing has reimagined the critical relationship among voting rights, race, and democracy in America. He is also a superb teacher and mentor, as this packed room shows. Um, he is a superb teacher and mentor who has already contributed greatly, enormously, to our community. And through the Emerging Scholars Program that he created some years ago before he got here, he has made important strides in opening the doors in the Legal Academy to scholars and teachers from underrepresented backgrounds. Sometimes a person joins an institution and you cannot remember what the institution was like before they got here. 
and that's Professor Charles. In the short time he's been here, he has helped Harvard Law School advance vital priorities and deepen our sense of community. He is wise and insightful. He is generous and kind. He is brave and decent. He is a close and trusted friend. In fact, it would take so much time, too much time, to share with you all that Professor Charles has already achieved on our campus in the short time he's been with us. He is the faculty director of the Charles Hamilton Institute, Houston Institute for Race and Justice. He chairs an important working group on the Belinda Sutton Quadrangle to honor the enslaved people whose labor contributed to the wealth that made the founding of this law school possible. In November, he helped organize the inaugural Belinda Sutton Distinguished Lecture, the first of an annual series of alternating um, talks and conferences, which will help deepen our understanding of slavery and its legacy and advance the ongoing pursuit of racial justice. And over the past two years, he has helped organize two wonderful lecture series for our community, last year's on democracy, and this year's on the role of the Supreme Court in a constitutional democracy. You can see he is a very busy person. Uh, Professor Charles is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Law Institute. He also served on President Biden's commission on the Supreme Court of the United States. Again, very busy <laughs> and very giving. Um, before joining Harvard Law School, Professor Charles taught at Duke Law School and at the University of Minnesota Law School. He also served as interim co-dean at University of Minnesota from 2006 to 2008. He's been a visiting professor at Georgetown, Virginia, and Columbia, and he has twice been awarded the Distinguished Teaching Award, once at the University of Minnesota Law School and once at Duke Law School. Guy Oriel Charles is an exceptional scholar, teacher, colleague, and human being. In the spirit of Professor Ogletree, he is also an exceptionally wise and generous mentor to our students. I am deeply grateful to be his colleague and his friend. Please join me in welcoming the Charles J. Ogletree Jr. Professor of Law, Guy Oriel Charles. Thank you. Thank you to um, our dean and fearless leader, um, John Manning. Um, it is such a privilege uh, to be a member of your faculty. I like to, I don't want to say that we are sheep uh, and you are a shepherd, um, but maybe I am a sheep. Um, but it really is a privilege um, to to be a member of this community and your leadership of this community. Um, I am so grateful to my colleagues, um, not just the dean. Um, the dean is uh, truly unbelievable, uh, and my colleagues are truly unbelievable. Uh, and I'm just so deeply grateful for welcoming uh, me to this community. There isn't anybody in this, uh, in this faculty, and some might say, I've only been here a short period of time, but there isn't anybody that I don't feel like I can talk to or who doesn't reach out or who doesn't talk. Um, you all are smart, um, obviously, um, but you're also kind and good, uh, and I am so grateful to be part of your community and to make it my own. Uh, and I look forward to working on that so much. I'm grateful to you that I will um, look forward to working on these next projects with you because I will definitely need your support. Um, I'm also thankful to my colleagues from Duke, as well as Minnesota. Uh, they too have contributed immensely, uh, and being part of a scholarly academic community, it really is about the broader village. Um, of course, my students, uh, my Section 5 students, uh, who uh, are represented here, my Section 7 students, my Law and Democracy students, my Critical Race students, my civil procedure students. You are my often my first interlocutors, my sparring partners, my motivators. Um, and I do understand that you will never appreciate the art um, and my drawing and my <laughs> capabilities. 
I get that. That's a shortcoming on your part. I think there's a drawback to like the 100th percentile on the LSAT. And that is a failure to appreciate good art when it is on the board for you, drawn by the world's greatest artist. Me, in case anybody um, had any doubts. Um, but I am grateful to you that you have welcomed me here and that you have allowed me to be part of your academic journey. And in many respects, I will be talking to you today. Uh, my administrative assistants, uh, particularly my current one, Marina Postel, um, couldn't do it without, without your help. My co-author, Luis Fuentes Rohr, who is here, who is a professor at Indiana Bloomington, uh, is here to, coincidentally to wrap up a project uh, that we have together, our last project, but it coincides with this event. We met a few days before law school, about 30 years ago, and in many ways we've been having the same conversation for the last 30 years. And as I'll talk about in a moment, the question that has haunted me then and still, both in law school and graduate school, is trying to come to terms with what self-governing people owe one another. Uh, and so it's been wonderful to be part of that conversation. I'm grateful for our collaboration uh, and hope that you see in what follows the evidence of that collaboration. I'm thankful to the administrative staff of this law school uh, and the staff of this law school. Um, I'm thankful uh, for the competency and the thoughtfulness and everything that you put into making things work. Um, I'm not perfect, uh, as you all have recognized, and so it does take a perfect system um, to help, at least for me, operate, and so I am so grateful for you. I would be remiss not to thank my parents and siblings, um, my brother, Jean-Luc Charles, Hans Luther, Corinne Esther, you could tell what my parents were thinking when they named us. Um, my parents left Haiti many decades ago in search of a better future for their kids. They toiled in factories, they cleaned offices, they sacrificed of themselves. So to the Reverend Joseph and Marie Charles, merci. Au profond de mon coeur, je vous aime. To my kids, the three of them, who are now the same age as the kids, that I am teaching, it's weird to get, understand that I am neither cool at home or at work. I don't think that's fair, and I'd like my faculty colleagues to do something about it. Um, so my kids, who are amazing and, um, and the source of our inspiration, um, and really, in many respects, uh, the drive behind so much of what I do, and I'm sure what we all do, and of course, most importantly, I'm grateful to my spouse, Laura Charles. Laura and I met in college. Um, I couldn't ask for a better partner, friend. I owe you everything, um, and I will try to give you the rest of my life. Um, thanks to those who I fin financially supported this chair. Uh, thanks to you to Professor Wilkins, uh, to Ken and Ken and Adebayo, um, it is a real honor and pleasure. Um, and really now, thanks to the real honoree, Professor Charles Ogletree, few people have had an impact on the field of race, law, um, criminal justice as Professor Ogletree. He is as distinguished of an academic as one could find. The author of multiple books, I counted at least eight, over 50 law review articles, he has been a counselor to presidents, world, world and business leaders. He has buildings named after him, as my colleague Michael Stein reminded me. Uh, again, the amazing faculty here, people providing you information to include in your lecture. Uh, uh, he has a courthouse named after him as well. Um, his convening power, some of you know, was absolutely magical. When he convened an event, he could command the presence of people from all walks of life, low and high, politics, entertainment, law, people from the streets, people from the courtroom, those who walked in the halls of economic power in the boardroom. Uh, and of course, he never forgot to always try to take everyone with him. He founded the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, um, as the dean has said. I hope that he is proud of how we are building on his legacy at the Institute. 
um, and the projects that we are taking on, uh, but perhaps more than his accomplishments, his decency and his mentorship. Um, I can't tell you the number of people when it was announced that I was coming to Harvard uh, and that I was going to be the Charles J. Ogletree Jr. Professor of Law who emailed me and called, and I think in a threatening manner, <laughs> reminding me of what Professor Ogletree meant to them and how he shaped and altered the course of their career, and essentially saying, don't screw up his legacy. Um, it is a profound honor uh, to be associated with Professor Ogletree's legacy. He used his intellect, his influence, his resources to make the world a better place and improve the lives of others. His shoes are too big to fill. So I think the best way of expressing my gratitude and thanks to him is to quote his words back to him, which he penned as tribute to the um, late judge A. Leon Higabotham, the legendary black federal judge. So he said of Leon Higabotham, and I say of Charles Ogletree Jr., it is impossible to acknowledge fully the many accomplishments of Professor Ogletree. One can only connect a thumbnail sketch of his many accomplishments and even that continues, consumes many pages. Suffice it to say, however, when it comes to a substantial and lasting impact on the civil rights movement, it is difficult to identify anyone who comes close in terms of power, depth, breath, eloquence of Professor Ogletree. He is a civil rights legend, and his contributions will serve as a guiding force to the 20, into the 21st century. And so to his family, his spouse, Pamela Barnes, his children, I understand that this is a sacred trust. And it is my pledge to uphold his legacy and to make it known to future and upcoming generations. Fred Rogers, yes, I'm going to quote Fred Rogers <laughs> of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yes, I am old. I've accepted that. Fred Rogers, in the course of an acceptance speech for an award that he was receiving, asked his audience to take 10 seconds to reflect for the people for whom they are thankful, that they are thankful for. Because in many ways, he recognized that a celebration of one is really a celebration of all. And so I'm going to ask us to just take 10 seconds and reflect on the people who have brought you this far and for whom you are thankful. And then I promise I will not stall any longer. <laughs> we will talk about the twilight of the civil rights movement. Ten seconds. Thank you. All right, so now what was promised to you this evening? You might call it false advertising. The title, Identity Crisis. Sounds like a, the, an upcoming movie, right? First you have to scare them. The Future of Racial Equality and the Twilight of the Civil Rights Movement. It is a risk to present a lecture on the next project, one that you're starting to think about, to map out. It's a risk to do it in front of an August body, a body of students, faculty colleagues, spouse, co-author. But I couldn't resist the opportunity. I'm the eldest of four to think about something out loud <laughs> and to invite you to come with me or to put it differently as I've tried to remind people what it means to be the eldest of four, especially in the family that I grew up in. It means that, hey, how do you get everybody else to do your work for you? <laughs> so do my work for me. What follows will be partly descriptive, partly predictive, and a tiny bit prescriptive. I will aim to persuade you to consider seriously that we as a country are in the midst of an identity crisis. And if we're not in the midst of one, we're about to enter one. We will be trying to figure out who we are, what our values are. Now this presumes that we had a stable identity up until now. Twilight of the civil rights consensus assumes that we had a civil rights consensus. I will make that assumption explicit and for your consideration 
I will also offer the content of that consensus. I will then urge you to consider that we are in the twilight of that consensus and will sketch in even more speculative terms uh, the potential paths for the future and what that might look like. All right, let's go. Try to do this quickly. All right, the first claim. The end of the civil rights movement resulted in what I will call a civil rights consensus. There are many ways in which we can characterize a civil rights movement. One way to characterize it is to view it as a fundamental challenge to the American socio-political order. It challenged our conception of what mattered, who had standing. It challenged the polity's ideas of equal opportunity, material well-being, and dignity. Until the civil rights movement, the United States more or less understood its identity in very narrow racial terms. This was a polity for white people by white people. The Civil War, of course, first challenged that notion, and it resulted in what seemed like a fundamental structural accommodation in our formal law. So we're all familiar with the Reconstruction Amendments of 13th, 14th, and 15th, 15th Amendments. But we know how the story ends. Reconstruction was short-lived and was followed by Redemption and Jim Crow. Redemption, Redemption and Jim Crow reaffirmed that white supremacy was the country's central organizing principle. It was its core identity. We the people did not include we the colored people. Put differently, if not provocatively, perhaps until the civil rights movement, Plessy versus Ferguson provided a better description of the American political, legal, social order than Reconstruction did than the Reconstruction Amendments did, and specifically. The Civil Rights Movement confronted the legal, political, economic order for how it used race to define equality and to artificially construct material scarcity, to generate indifference to precarity, and to justify a caste system by race. Prior to the Civil Rights Movement, one could not say with a straight face, one could not claim that black people and people of color were self-governing or part of the self-governing people. And their repeated demands, or repeated demands by black people and people of color joined the ranks of the self-governing was faced with widespread and continued resistance. The outcome of the confrontation pressed by the civil rights movement could have gone a number of different direction, and directions, including outright rejection, which was indicative of the past, Alternatively, the political, legal, and economic order could have been forced to rethink the individualistic ethos that undergirds much of the way that we think about um, eco uh, the economy, the moral, legal, and social practices. So we use the shorthand phrase, e equality of opportunity, not equality of results, as a stand-in for our individualistic ethic. We seem to be collectively hardwired to react in a Pavlo Pavlovian way to a racial altar-like stories. Instead of fundamentally rethinking the role of the state, the economy, civil society, and how they condition opportunity and create scarcity, and how they structure precarity, and how they commodify dignity, we have instead largely opted to continue to think of opportunity in individualistic terms. This is true, by the way, duck, for both left and right. Though the challenge of the civil rights movement did not result in this type of radical restructuring, it did result in another type, different type, of radical, though incremental, rethinking. And here, incremental, I'm using in descriptive and not normative terms. Our legal, political, moral institutions conceded, slowly, sometimes haltingly, but perceptively and convincingly that the claims by black and brown people, their claims that they could not be denied the opportunity to compete for the full benefits of the constitutional, political, economic order simply because of their race, those claims had to be taken seriously. The civil rights movement resulted in what I'm now calling, or what I'm calling this moment, not that I'm calling it in time immemorial, the civil rights consensus. And I'll articulate it in this way, as a matter of formal law and also as a matter of political morality, non-white others have special standing 
and must be accounted for within the constitutional, political, and economic order. The special standing is because of our history of white supremacy and racial discrimination. That history and other work Luis and I have described as pathological racism, that history compels the polity, including law, politics, society, to be solicitous of the equality claims of non-white others. They too are part of the self-governing polity. And surveying the landscape, we can recognize the familiar and almost cliched markers indicating the civil rights consensus. Right? One must begin with Brown versus Board, especially if you want to sit on the court. All right? The Brown Revolution is a marker of that consensus, the 64 Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act, 68 Fair Housing Act, Immigration Naturalization Act of 1965, perhaps even the court's decision in South Carolina versus Katzenbach, and maybe, if you want to stretch, its decision in Grutter versus Bollinger. And in law, we can consider in this vein the development of the political process school, most elaborately articulated by John R. Ely's Democracy and Distrust, which builds upon Justice Stone's United States versus Caroline Products footnote four, right? justifying judicial review to protect discrete and insular minorities from political prejudice. And of course, by discrete and insular, we roughly mean, not specifically, but roughly mean race, in the first instance, and by race, we roughly mean black Americans, and I'll touch on this in, the, in, in a moment, but suffice so it to say for now that black people as the, are the paradigmatic and quintessential minority. Or consider the anti-subordination theory of equal protection, best associated with Owen Fiss's article, Groups and the Equal Protection Clause. Theories of anti-subordination contend that law should actively destabilize structures of subordination that reinforce the second class status of historically subordinated groups. And of course, African Americans as the quintessential examples. These are, example, these are um, uh, demonstrations of the point. They reflect, um, in many respects, an agreement that non-white others had distinctive standing because of the history of racial discrimination that the polity owed them special solicitude. And as a matter of formal law, political morality, social inclusion, they must also be accounted for within the constitutional order. Now, the consensus had its contours and boundaries. In particular, it was rigorous, rigorously committed to formal equality and haphazardly committed to addressing structural inequality, but differently, it swung, though not always equally, between anti-classification and anti-subordination. Moreover, it operated largely, though not exclusively, within a black-white binary. The problem of racial discrimination was prim primarily about the structural subordination of black people, and it is black subordination that largely commanded attention. It largely shielded from the inclusion shielded the inclusion demands of others, um, and it was only willing to go so far to accommodate equality claims. This is because notwithstanding our commitment to equality and inclusion, a racial hierarchy in, in which whiteness was viewed as a dominant racial group still existed, right? attempted to hold on to both. We can begin with round two's instruction that desegregation proceed with all deliberate speed, as our key example, but it is not the only one. We could also include, um, and here Brown we could interpret to mean equality, but only so far and only so fast, or Washington versus Davis's intent requirement. Yes, we're against inequality, but only of a certain type. I'm using these cases as illustrative shorthands, I'm not t aiming to tell a story about the limits of courts. And in fact, to the contrary, even the Intergalactic Voting Rights Act of 1965 did not reflect a commitment to rooting out structural discrimination. It only went after the worst discriminators and the worst forms of discrimination. I mean, trying to think about this, I'm hard pressed to identify a statute that was committed to rooting out structural discrimination, root and branch. So then allow me to suggest that a feature of the civil rights consensus is that we will go so far and only so far to achieve equality. 
We will do affirmative action, but a radical restructuring of resource allocation? No. We will do affirmative action, but only for so long. In other words, civil rights consensus did operate within a racial hierarchy. Right? Still roughly white over non-white, the equality claims of white Americans more often than not prevailing against competing claims of non-white others. And this is the central insight of the critical race theorists. The liberty and equality preferences of some are still given first order preference when they clash against the liberty and equality preferences of others. Yet nevertheless, claims of racial equality did capture our constitutional, political, and moral attention. We were committed to racial equality, and we made significant progress. Yes, often incrementally, but significant. Race did real work. Race was the central mechanism through which we filtered questions of equality and deprivation. Since the civil rights movement, race has essentially defined opportunity, scarcity, material deprivation. We've defined it roughly in racial terms. So here's a very quick example. Palmer versus Thompson of 1971, city of Jackson, Mississippi closed his swimming pools and instead of desegregating them, the court held that it does not violate the Equal Protection Clause for the city to close the pools and accepted the city's pretextual reasons for doing so. The compromise I think here is roughly clear. You don't have to provide a material good, but if you do provide it, you must do so without excluding people because of their race. This also meant that in our political system, if we want to make a claim about deprivation, we are often forced to make it in racial terms in order for it to resonate, right? In order for it to resonate sometimes morally, sometimes politically, sometimes even legally. So in the context of voting, what is the best way to capture the attention of both law and politics with respect to a voting restriction like a voter ID? Um, well, we're forced to think about it through the lens of race. We're not moved by the fact that perhaps a vast number of people don't participate, but you put it in racial terms, look, this affects brown and black people, we're compelled to take notice. Race was the central and is the central mechanism with, within which we filtered questions of deprivation. Now, though this framework was imperfect, the civil rights consensus more or less muddled along, and one might argue that it did more than muddle along, that it more or less worked. It was certainly our existing equilibrium. And now for the second claim. That consensus, in my view, is dissipating. That is, we are in the twilight of the civil rights consensus. Put differently, with each passing day, we are increasingly less committed to the proposition that non-white others have distinctive claims on the polity because of our history of discrimination. We are less committed, and ever more so, to the proposition, we are less committed to the proposition that the polity owes them a special solicitude, that as a matter of formal law, both pol and political morality, uh, maybe even as a matter of, of, of social inclusion, uh, that they must be accounted for within the constitutional, political, social, and economic order. By all expectations, the court will soon hold that race-conscious admissions policies are no longer consistent with, with the law. It might reach this conclusion based upon the Equal Protection Clause or Title VI or both. We've already seen the uh, analogous move in the voting context or in race-conscious student assignment plans that were at issue. Very few legal academics today believe that the political process theory explains our, our race jurisprudence. Anti-subordination theory is increasingly, dare one say it, irrelevant. Um, Anti-classification is on the verge of complete dominance. Now, this is, again, not just a story about courts. The current fights that we are having about critical race theory in the wake of Brown, the fight was about the presence of black kids in schools. Today, the fight is largely about the intellectual enterprise the story that we tell ourselves as, as who, about who we are as Americans, the stories about our identity, our intellectual traditions, our legacy. This is also true with the 1619 Project. One can take issue with the historiography, but I don't actually think that's where the real fight is. I think the 1619 Project is controversial because it is attempting to tell a different story, a different origin story. This is also true, I think, 
with January 6th and the assault on Capitol Hill. There's a sense that um, the paradigm is shifting. There's a loss of identity. But even beyond that, we could also see antagonism between and among racial groups, Latino versus black, black versus Asian, Asian versus Latino, antagonism among particular groups, black versus black, descendants of American diaspora versus those of the uh, uh, Caribbean, descendants of American slaves, descendants of, Afri of the African diaspora, the explicit return of anti-Semitism. There is something that is going on in terms of how we are approaching and thinking through and working through one another. And my suggestion is it's reflecting a paradigm shift. The underpinnings of the consensus are disintegrating. And so what does that mean? Well, it means then that we are in the midst or about to enter an identity crisis, trying to figure out who we are as a country. And for the legal theorists in the room, one might think about this in Acromanian terms, our political, legal, moral commitments are up for grabs and for renegotiation. The terms of the new civil rights consensus are being debated and contended right, in our moment. Now, I think the terms of, the, of that consensus will be different from the last. We are starting to regularly and seriously refer to ourselves as a multiracial and multicultural polity. This means that the black-white binary can't hold. It also means, and it's different from what the prior consensus looked like, that people of color have agency. They have political, economic, social, cultural agency in a way that they never had before. More than any other time period in American history, they will be able to influence the direction of their future. So if the civil rights consensus is over, and if much is up for grabs, what is next? How will we redefine ourselves? What will the fault lines look like for the 21st century if race characterize the 19th and the 20th? How will we address structural racial inequality? What will do the ameliorative work that race has done in our society? So here I will be even more cursory and even more speculative. I will name check some possibilities. One possibility is that we coalesce around a class consciousness. And in some respects, one can begin to see the seeds of some of this work even at um, HLS, where we have this sort of this amazing group on law and political economy trying to help us think about the relationship between law, political economy, and structural inequality. Another possibility is that partisanship takes over. Right? We are increasingly dividing ourselves into tribes. They're roughly racially identifiable, at least for now. That may change. Another possibility is that there will be a different ideology a scary one, liberalism versus illiberalism. Or maybe there will be a national or broad supra-identity. It is also possible that we devolve into a type of racial essentialized tribalism. Now, of course, some of these options are more worrisome than others. And of course, many of us, particularly those in this room, will have agency to try to shape what those options look like. As I mentioned at the very beginning, and here, like a good preacher's son, let me indicate that I am in my clothes. <laughs> my work has been animated by trying to understand what we owe each other as self-governing people, as people who are theoretically committed to the enterprise of democracy. Like other eras before us, we have an obligation to pass on the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. I want to leave you with a question posed by Professor Ogletree himself. What are we going to do to confront the challenges we face in race relations? How are we going to restructure and rethink economic, racial, structural inequality? I invite you to join me in thinking through the answer. And once you've come up with it, I invite you to please share it with me, because <laughs> we have another book to write. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much. And now, yes, Professor Sigerson. <laughs> Questions, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you so much for um, the comments. I, I, I still can't underscore again uh, how really grateful I am to all of you, to every single one of you. I have the best students in the world, um, and they know it. Um, I try not to remind them of it, by the way. I work every hard every single day to walk in the classroom and to say no, uh, but they know it. Um, they know that I love them. Um, the best colleagues that one can ask for, um, the most amazing leadership and the dean. And, and unfortunately, he knows it because he keeps asking me to do things and knows that I'm not going to say no because <laughs> how can you turn down that face? Have you seen it? Um, all right. Um, and so, uh, and, and the generosity of my friends and family, um, I, so much to be thankful for. Okay, now I'll go to the real question. Um, I think it is true, right, 40, 50 years down the road, um, when somebody else is giving the Professor Jeannie so Gerson lecture, <laughs> right, because they've now uh, occupied the most distinguished chair at Harvard Law School, um, they will then be thinking about the fact that, okay, what are, what's the hallmark of the different, con of, of, of the shift? All right, all right. But then, I'll, right, um, twilight comes night. Night is could be bad, but after um, night comes the dawn. Um, so, what could that world looks like? Look, look like, right? Um, it is worth thinking about that. This is an opportunity to rethink resource distribution and resource allocation. All right, Lonnie Guinier used to, to say, "What work do we want race to do?" Right? And often we make race do the work of resource allocation. All right, without it, then, we're forced to confront how we think through, for example, educational resources. Right? And we're forced to confront the um, difficult sets of questions, how in a polity as different and diverse as ours, do we assure and provide opportunity Right? And not just the ability to run the rat race. Um, right? That's, that seems like a very thin way of understanding opportunity. But really, how do we create and structure um, lives that are meaningful? All right? I think that's the opportunity that's presented by the forced, enforced shift. Right? So one of the things that Luis and I have tr tried to understand in our work on voting rights is that uh, when you don't have the satisfying move, satisfying move, you kind of force back the drawing board to say, okay, what do we really want? What can we really have? And this is an opportunity to, to think about that. And it's an opportunity for institutions like this one and the people who are in this room, the, the young people with lots of hair, um, right? Um, yes, I'm, at least I am. 
um, jealous. Um, Luis is beyond jealous, have you seen his head? Um, so the, the young people with a lot of hair could begin to think about what do they want their future to look like? And I think that's the opportunity that is presented. Yes. You're supposed to help me. Um, okay, so yeah, here's why I think it is um, a sense of optimism that may may not be well placed, may be ill informed, may maybe as a failure of not doing enough reading. Right, that I have this uh, the sense that um, given the once you sort of take out the crutch. Um, and the, the types of moves that we're starting to see in the political process, right? So um, I'll, I'll admit it, oh, this is recorded, so I will only admit it a little bit of it. Um, <laughs> when Bernie Sanders first came on the scene, you thought, wild, wild person. Um, <laughs> but one begins, you could see the movement, at least on one political party, and actually, I think it's true for, for both. There is, I think, in both political parties, a broader consideration of the um, of class consciousness. You know, whether you agree with Sohab Omari or, or not, um, he is trying, and, and people like him are trying to put on the table from the right the um, the considerations and concerns of. Um, people who are losing in the current socioeconomic order, um, right? And certainly we see that, I think, on the left. Some people have argued that, have said, said that Joe Biden, in many respects, sort of like the agenda that he is currently representing is a lot closer to the Bernie Sanders type of an agenda than it was to the Barack Obama agenda. Right? Now, if, you know, that may be wrong, it may be delusional, but if it is true, those are things that one can build upon. I'm not going to tell you about what seems to be a revival of labor. Um, you can tell me about that five ways from Sunday. Right? That seems, right, that, those seems to seem to be an indication. Um, you know, so it may be the case that things like Occupy weren't simply one-offs, but shoots. Um, right, maybe even seeds that uh, are going to help us to think about how to structure in a way that ref that is that is a bit more equitable. Um, right, so um, I don't know whether you're convinced, but those are the those are the indicators um, of the, reading those tea leaves. The indicators of why um, I can be I can say. Per the first place I started, I think it reflected a rough hierarchy. So I think you're right to pick up on that. Um, the first place I started was to say, look, one possibility is class, and maybe that you know that might be uh, the um, the time period and the first time in a very long time in which that is something that we that we can begin to think about. Professor Mack. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I would say that, you know, academics, uh, they're, we all come in all sorts of stripes, um, right? And I think you're certainly right 
that one of the things that we do well is to try to think about, um, explain um, ideas movement, right? Few do it, um, you do it as, as better than uh, just about anybody, um, right? So I think that there's a lot to be said for that move. Now I don't, um, I think I would have been remiss not to say something about where I think things are going to go, right? And that's why it is, um, I framed it as the thinnest, like sort of the thinnest part and the most speculative part. Um, and of course the part that one is less sure of. Um, but yes, I think I, sh I share um, a large part of what you're saying of how to think about this from the historical or the intellectual underpinnings of what, where, what's causing, what's leading, um, and to reflect on it. And, um, you know, and of course, it'd uh, be great to, to continue that conversation. Thank you. One more? OK, all right. Professor Wilkins. So did I miss anybody First, on that side? Most importantly, I want to say uh, that Tree would be so proud to be here to hear this talk. And of everything he's done in his domain, and uh, for those of us who were here when he was here, that includes the three of us. So thank you. Um, I guess the question I want to ask is there's an optimism that which is you're kind of assuming that we're going to get to frame our identity ourselves as Americans. And I wonder where globalization and larger scale forces mm. uh, are playing into mm. your story. Because what I see more and more is us reacting to our, uh, to the various threats perceived real uh, around our wonder kind of particularly given your own biography mm -hmm. uh, how globalization and those bigger forces ah. Yeah, great question, and questions that, I'll, that um, I'd have to think a lot more about. There's certainly no doubt that there are other types of forces, globalization, technology, right, um, you know, that will affect a sense of agency and identity. Um, Right, so I, 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 think, I think that's definitely true. Yet at the same time, I think that there is a um, way in which uh, both, uh, partly because in many respects there's an inter inward look, right? I mean, the parochial nature of the American constitutional system, though you know, f buffeted by other structural forces, I think will compel us to think about what does it mean to be American in the latter part of the 21st and early part of the 22nd century. So without a doubt, um, lots of other things will influence that determination. Um, so I'm, I'm not assuming that the only thing will be inward looking, uh, but I think um, part of that equation will be internal and, um, and right now my thinking is what could that look like?
magically appear 